has no lines. Okay, let's get started with um, a new series of three lectures, here they are, on learning and memory. So we finished sensory systems now, you know, everything about how information gets into the brain, and now we're going to turn to what your brain then does with that in order to consolidate it, store it, and use it for the future. Uh, so there's three chapters in the book here that cover that. Um, and as with all the other lectures, it's going to be a lot of material. It's, it's kind of similar to maybe the vision lectures to some extent, in the sense that this will be kind of an overview of memory systems. Um, and then there'll be uh, some of the uh, uh, synaptic circuitry that underlies memories, and then there'll be other forms of memory and memory modulation um, in the next lecture. So here they all are with, uh, as usual, the, some of the main take-home points to help you anchor uh, the lectures as you get them. Let's see, any <clears throat> announcements that there were? Oh, there was one. So um, next week, Thursday, in discussion section, you have like, I guess, learning and memory. Then there is Thanksgiving. And then there used to be no discussion section in the week after Thanksgiving, but now there is one. So a discussion section. I think the original syllabus, there was nothing listed or something. So there will be a discussion section in the Thursday after Thanksgiving on, I guess, um, illnesses of the brain. Okay. Any other questions, any logistical questions or anything from the class? Okay. Um, so, as usual, uh, try to take a look at the PDFs and try to read the chapters um, in the book before the, the upcoming lectures. So, here's the topic um, uh, of today. Here's a question that you guys <laughs> might want to map onto analogous questions that we've asked in the past with respect to sensory systems. It was quite easy in the case of vision and hearing. It was harder in the case of somatosensation. Does anybody want to take a stab at answering, giving an answer to the question of what is memory? What would you say memory is? Yes. It might be a bad guess, but to know how to describe and remembering. Okay, great. So that was a, a straightforward mapping onto <laughs> the uh, answers we had in the past. And certainly it's in part uh, correct. So the answer was to know what is where by remembering. It shows you that memory is active. And in order to remember something, you need to often employ a very strategic uh, thing. So if you experience this firsthand all the time, and you need to remember things for an exam. They don't just pop into your head. You have to try and retrieve them. They're in there, but you might not be able to get them out of your head. Um, and then knowing what is where is certainly part of it. Um, and that's actually a big part of what we'll uh, talk about in today's lecture in relation to declarative memory, which is thought to be um, memory that binds together different types of information about events, like what and where, and in the case of memory, declarative memory, or episodic memory, also when. So you would indeed you would embellish what you just said and say to know what was where when, uh, and to do that through um, recollection. Um, let's just go think about that for a second more and see if anybody wants to come up with a further answer, because if you think about it the way we just said it, so that the memory is to know what is where and when it happened by remembering it. If you just stop there, you would say, so what's the function of that? So I think about the past, and I you know, can reminisce about something that happened at a certain place at a certain time. So how, what, what use is that? It already happened. There's stuff in the past. What use is, the, is thinking about the past? It happened. I have no control over it. So is there a more functional um, uh, answer that somebody would like to take a stab at? Yes? Storage Great. OK. So, it's, so you could embellish the initial answer, and then you could say you know, the, the mechanism is indeed to know what was where, when, uh, by recollecting it but then to use it for something. And you don't want to use it in order to think about the past. Like I said, the past happened. So you want to have some answer that says, 
Memory is the ability to recollect information from the past in order to guide actions into the future. So that's so the point of memory is to plan for the future by learning from the past. So if you have some answer like that, uh, that for instance you could embellish on a problem set or an exam, that would be good to think about. Okay, so we've answered the question partially or given you hints for the direction in which the answer might lie. Um, it's the answer, I should say, the answer to this question, what is memory? I think the, quest, the answers we just got are actually very good. Uh, but it's difficult, it's more difficult than in the case of vision and in the case of the auditory system. For the same reason, it was difficult in the case of the somatosensory system, which is that there's not one kind of memory. So there are many different types of memory. Uh, the one that comes to mind most easily is this type here, declarative memory, which is recollecting events uh, that you can consciously re-experience in our own case, but there are many other types of memory that are not like that. Uh, learning how to ride a bicycle, Pavlovian fear conditioning, many, so it's many, many different kinds of things. And that's one reason it's, uh, it's a little more difficult to come up with an answer to this question. But certainly one thing that unites them is to be able to use information from things that happened in the past to guide future action. The two big Types of memory we'll talk about, declarative, which is sort of everything you can tell me about and what the person on the street would normally mean by memory, and everything else, which is like how to play chess, how to ride a bicycle, uh, all kinds of memory that are not things you can tell me about, but they're more things that you've learned how to do rather than information that you can recollect and tell me about. In addition to those that heterogeneity and different types of memory, there is heterogeneity or there are different types of um, phases of memory in terms of the mechanism. And typic typically these have been divided into three. That's not a, a strict partition, but there's initial encoding. You have to get stuff into the brain. There's consolidation, often over quite some time. You have to make sure that you don't forget it and it gets stabilized, often embellished. Sometimes you have false memories. There's lots of complicated stuff going on over time. And then eventually you have to get it back out again and retrieve it or recollect it. So those are, and those are all distinct stages of processing. So that also makes it more complicated. So I think we'll talk about those. We'll talk about types of declarative memory and some of the brain uh, systems. And then on Monday, uh, Henry Lester will tell you about the cellular and synaptic basis of memory. What do we know about the detailed cellular mechanisms that implement some of these, uh, in many cases, psychological uh, level processes. And then uh, next week, Wednesday, we'll talk about non-declarative memory and also memory modulation. So there's several core puzzles to think about, uh, thinking about memory. The two main ones are, are here. So one, and they're kind of complements of one another. So one is, how do you get uh, changes encoded in the brain? Um, so you might, and you might immediately think of multiple mechanisms, and there are multiple mechanisms. Many of those map onto multiple uh, phases in time. So you might think, well, if I just keep a, neuro keep a bunch of neurons active and they keep firing in some kind of reverberatory activity, that's memory. I would have some representation, and as long as it's active in the brain, in the sense of neurons continuing to fire after a stimulus has disappeared, that's memory. You might think that that wouldn't be a very efficient way to store all of your memories, and indeed it's not, because you have to keep all your neurons firing for everything that you ever experienced. So in addition to that, you might say, well, I can turn them off, but I'm going to have some other changes, for instance, actual ultrastructural changes in the connections that they make with one another, or in the genes that they can transcribe. And to some extent, those processes map onto short kinds of memory, like working memory that you can think about actively, and long-term memory that decades later you can recollect. So it's many different kinds of things. But that's one challenge. How do you do that? How do you encode those changes in the brain? And then if you do that, it raises a corresponding problem about how you can hang on to anything as stable. If your brain's changing all the time because of all the memories being encoded, then how do you, how do you stabilize anything if your brain is, brain is changing all the time? So you need to have very complicated mechanisms. On the one hand, to separate from one another and avoid interference between different memories and to stabilize them. Um, and on the other hand, to make sure that those, that, that you don't have too many memories, but can, you need to have filters, uh, filters in, in place. You don't want to remember everything. 
Uh, although, as I'll show you in, or allude to in just a couple of slides, there are people who seem to remember almost everything, uh, curiously enough. Okay, um, in, so in terms of those filters, there are a bunch of constraints, many of them actually fairly innate, in terms of what you can learn and how you learn about it. And you, you all know this, it's much easier for you to learn in this class than it would be for Henry Lester or myself if we didn't know the material because our brains are older. It's much more difficult uh, once you're out of puberty to learn a new language. So there are certain windows where the brain is, um, is more open to learning about certain kinds of stimuli. And that applies to lots of different things. Even if you look at very basic kinds of conditioning in animals, learning associations between stimuli isn't arbitrary. It's much more difficult or impossible for animals to learn some things than to learn other things. So there's a lot of filters into place already that predispose the brain to be able to learn certain things rather than others. So language is one example of that. Okay, so we had this. Here's the, we already answered this question. Um, here's the Wikipedia entry for it. Um, I don't know if that adds much. It does point out that as originally conceived, memory, and of course as historically mostly studied, memory and learning and memory have been studied behaviorally in psychology. So it's only much more recent that we've looked at the underlying neurobiology. So you should keep those separate. A lot of the terms and concepts derived from psychology, and then it's to some extent a separate question, or at least you want to keep it separate in your head in terms of how that relates to the neurobiology. For instance, short-term versus long-term memory. Those have specific definitions psychologically, but it's not at all clear how these, those relate to those same terms, short-term versus long-term, yours used in neuro, neurobiology. They would have different, different definitions. Uh, this is one of the um, main psychological guys, this uh, funny-looking person up here, Endel Tulving, is a very famous uh, psychologist who uh, uh, came up, or was one of the many people, that has tried to articulate what, at least for psychologists and also for many lay people, um, is sort of the hallmark of memory, and again, in not everybody's, but in many psychologists' theories, is unique to human memory. Uh, so he has this somewhat fanciful quote here about evolution building a time machine in our brain. And episode, the, the main, uh, one of the main puzzles, one of the th main things that people have thought is unique to humans is to be able volitionally to re-experience events that are not in the here and now. So the idea would be that, of course, animals learn, animals have memories, but animals are sort of stuck to whatever it is that their senses provide. That determines the content of their conscious experience, they're conscious of what's in front of them, of the world around them. You need not be, and most of the time you're not. You're daydreaming and you're drifting off, and you're not at all conscious of what's in front of you, but you're thinking about things that could happen in the future, uh, that happened in the past, and so that ability to zoom around in time uh, seems to be something that's extremely difficult to explain. It's been very difficult, for obvious reasons, to find clear evidence for it in animals other than humans. And it depends on a particular brain system uh, that, uh, that we now know quite a, quite a bit about. So that's, that's one quote here. OK, so what is that brain system? So here is, the, is one taxonomy of memory. And this is not a taxonomy that e everyone would uh, endorse. It's uh, kind of coarse. But at least at the coarsest level up here, People agree with this, that there are two, so this is one main thing that you should know. There are two broad types of memory, declarative, also called relational memory, and everything else. Declarative has been studied fairly well and related to a particular part of the brain, the hippocampus and other structures close to it in the medial temporal lobe. Uh, and that's been shown in humans, it's been shown in animals, and there's very good evidence there. We know a lot now about the mechanisms, etc. Non-declarative memory is very heterogeneous, and it's a whole bunch of different things. Some of them we know about a fair amount, like Pavlovian fear conditioning, that's sort of over here and depends on structures like the amygdala, and some of them a lot less. So it, it's a heterogeneous batch of things. What distinguishes declarative memory, um, intuitively, it's everything that you can tell me about. So it's if I asked you, tell me, some, you know, what's the capital of France? And you would say Paris. That would be an example of a semantic declarative memory. Or I could 
ask you, uh, tell me what you had for breakfast this morning, or tell me what you did yesterday. And that would be an example of declarative episodic memory. So it's facts and events that you can recollect. These things are all different than that. They're not things you can tell me about. It's like learning to ride a bicycle, play chess, or have some automatic response to a conditioned stimulus. Any questions about the, this basic distinction between declarative, which is also a couple of things, but they're all kind of similar to one another, that depends on one brain system, and non-declarative, which is a heterogeneous mix of everything that's not declarative. Any questions about that distinction? Okay, so those, and we're going to talk about this first one here today, and then focus on this one next Wednesday. So let's talk about the temporal components that I alluded to. So you have encoding or acquisition, and there's lots of filters and things that modulate this uh, that psychologists have studied. So for instance, the more recent something is, uh, the better you remember it. If you rehearse something, the better you remember it. If something is associated with strong arousal and attention, the better you remember it. All the things that you try to do when you encode information when you're studying for a class, for instance, right? So it's all of those things. It's not like just taking a picture of the world and then you're done. So there's very active mechanisms that prioritize information that gets access to consolidation. So there's stuff here at the beginning, attention, arousal, and so forth. Then what you have is a, a whole bunch of processes, which is whether these uh, different terms in here, that stabilize that memory so it becomes temporally durable. So you can think of something right now. You can be reading something in your textbook, and an hour later, it's gone. So you haven't consolidated it. So you need this consolidation mechanism. Many, many things uh, play a role here, and it takes place over some long duration. Uh, minutes to weeks to years. So it's, and as it does so, it becomes stabilized, it becomes embellished, and it becomes often abstracted and incorporated with other things. So many of your autobiographical episodic memories become converted into more abstract semantic memories that are facts. So for instance, you know that Paris is the capital of France, but if I asked you, well, give me the specific the specifics of how you know that. When exactly did you learn that? Where did you read that? Give me that specific autobiographical memory. That's lost. So you were, you said, I don't know, you know, I heard it multiple times. I read it in a book and somebody told me when I was little and, you know, whatever. A whole bunch of things. But now you've consolidated that into just a big, more abstract aggregate. You know that as a fact, but you don't know how you know it. You don't know how, you, how, it, how it got in. Um, other things, so other, we'll, we'll take a look briefly um, on Wednesday, next Wednesday, but it's important to point out there are many mechanisms here that modulate this. So even once you've got, once you've re studied the textbook and you're starting to consolidate something, it can get lost or it can get embellished. So if you have other things that come in that interfere, that's not good. If you don't sleep, that's not good. Sleep is actually one of the main, one of the big roles of sleep. It does many things, but one big role is to stabilize and consolidate memories. And people have studied that. So if you prevent people from sleeping and otherwise have the same temporal duration, if you have sleep, it will help consolidate your memories. Um, and then there is also, of course, some loss and embellishment, which is probably not indicated here. So memories can become false. You can have false memories over time. They can become repressed. You can have a lot of modulation here over time. So that's consolidation. And then finally, if you wanted to do something with it, you would recall it. Every time you recall a memory, of course, it becomes a stimulus in its own right. And so when you recall something, it can be re-encoded and then reconsolidated. And so you can have reconsolidation. Here's one scheme for how this um, works in the abstract. So if you see a car or some picture in your book, your visual cortices would have a representation of that. So what's schematized, that's schematized up here. So remember, we had all these different maps that map the color, the direction of motion, and so on in higher level visual cortices. You would have object recognition of this car and its context. This would be represented in sensory cortices. So that's your percept and presumably a big part of the content of your conscious visual experience of seeing a car. Then there would be higher level regions that encode conjunctions between that, the context in which the car occurred, when it happened, and so on, 
And this would be not just a single step, but a layered hierarchy. And then once you have that, the idea is that these higher order regions could sort of serve to reenact or simulate the original car. So you would take a look at this car. If you remember what it looks like, I could ask you tomorrow, form a visual image of the car. And you can do that by retroactivating the same visual cortical areas that were initially activated when you saw the car. So, and this, this does happen this way. So people have looked at this, for instance, with, uh, with uh, fMRI studies, that in this particular example of forming a visual image on the basis of memory for something that you saw before, you replay it in reverse. And that requires having these high-level regions that can sort of serve as pointers or recipes to reconstruct the same visual pattern in cortical regions that you would have got when you originally saw the car. Okay. Now, how do you get that? How do you trigger that? And of course, this, this is extremely complicated and often fails. So you know that you know something, but it's often very difficult to get at it. The two main mechanisms for um, retrieving memories are these two here. One is recognition memory. So that's retrieval triggered by the stimulus or something very similar to it. So when I go to the parking lot and see a car similar to my silver Honda Fit, of which there seem to be almost every car looks similar to mine, so I never find it, uh, I, you know, that triggers a, a recognition, and I recognize it as, uh, as my car. So recognizing recognition memory is one of the simplest forms of retrieving memory. You recognize something as familiar because you can match it with the representation that was there in memory. You see it again, and it matches. Recall is, is harder. So recall is also retrieval, but it's not triggered by seeing the same stimulus, but either spontaneous or by some, some symbolic cue. So I could ask you, just verbally, think, you know, describe to me your car. And that's harder. So because there you have to go from some very symbolic tag that doesn't yet give you much of the similarity structure of the representation you want to get at, and do the whole retroactivation and imagine seeing the car. But so those two are the main forms of retrieving memories. Recognition, which is kind of like a matching, and recollection, which is real uh, synthesis. Any questions about those? They're all clear to people psychologically. OK, here's some other terms to know. So encoding, we already talked about. Consolidation, we talked about. Retrieval, and the two types, recognition or recall. Um, and actually, let me just go straight to uh, working memory here. So this slide you need to know in detail, and it uh, will uh, embellish a bit on it. So you have things coming in. You you're, have your eyes and your ears open, and you have sensory percepts coming in, and then you can act on that. There is a part of memory in your brain called short-term memory psychologically, or working memory, it's probably a better term, um, which stores those things. It has specific features. Uh, it corresponds to what it is that you're conscious of when you think about something. It has a very limited capacity, and it tends to be fairly ephemeral. So if I give you a bunch of numbers, uh, 403, 689, 1, right? It, you can hear them, and now I ask you, okay, give them back to me. When you do that with people, when they're paying attention, they can give back about seven or so, but not 20 normally. So there's a limit. It seems to be around seven, depending on how you chunk the information that's coming in. Quite limited, way more limited than your long-term, than everything you know in your long-term memory. And it lasts about a minute or so. Uh, so this is a very specific kind of memory. It's an essential initial buffer before you can encode anything into long-term memory. So you need, to get, you need to see it or hear it and get it into your brain. Then you need to think about it and have load it into working memory, which is this temporary limited capacity buffer. And only then can it be transferred via the hippocampal formation into long-term memory stores. And long-term memory is everything that you would know once you have consolidated it into long-term memory. And that's very different. That's stuff that can be there for a lifetime. It doesn't have just a one-minute uh, half-life. And its capacity, as far as we know, is unbounded in, in humans. So it has a huge capacity. Everything that you could ever uh, remember. And then, of course, the trick is you need to get it back out. To get it back out, you have to reload it back into working memory so you can think about it, and then you can tell me about it or act on it. OK, so those are the two basic divisions. Short-term memory, long-term memory. Short-term has a, lasts about a minute or so and has a capacity of about seven pieces of information. 
Long term has no bound on time or on capacity as far as we know. Does that make sense to people? This here, working memory, is known to depend a lot on mechanisms in the frontal cortex. And transferring this into long-term memory depends on a structure we'll take a look at in a minute, which is the hippocampal formation. And then there's lots, and lo as you would imagine, there are lots and lots of modulations that can facilitate or block each of these uh, processes. The most dramatic evidence for dissociations between these, we'll take a look at this in a minute, but just to, to tell you, is if you have damage to particular parts of the brain, you can impair one or the other uh, of these. So for instance, you can have patients that have damage to the hippocampus, and their, short, their working memory is perfectly fine, but they can't transfer that, any of that into long-term memory. There's another form of memory that uh, psychologists uh, like to use. This is essentially just at the encoding stage. So what people call iconic memory is very short sensory trace before you think about it, before it's loaded into working memory. Working memory, as I mentioned, is like up to about a minute, half a minute to a minute. There are different aspects of it. One's the, the best one, best understood ones that people have studied is visual spatial working memory. So if you can, ju you're just seeing visual patterns without encoding them into language and encoding things into language and rehearsing that in your head. So if I give you something to remember, you have to generally convert it to one of those two things. It's extremely difficult to do anything other than that. So for instance, if I give you a whole bunch of odors and ask you to keep thinking about those, that tends to be impossible unless you put a verbal label on them, in which case you're converting them to the phonological loop. So you usually have to think about things and hold them in working memory, either by rehearsing them as, as words that you just have in a little verbal loop in your head, or as something visual like a pattern or a movie or something that need not be verbal. Those seem to be the main ones. And then long-term memory is sort of anything longer than working memory. As I mentioned, um, these have different terms uh, generally in neurobiology. Um, so there are also short-term and long-term memory mechanisms. The main difference there is that typically by long-term, people mean something that depends on gene transcription and short-term something that doesn't. You don't quite map onto these same time scales as the psychological categories. So how are these? Here's one scheme for how memory relates to what it is that you're conscious of. So initially, so here are these three uh, time scales of memory that we just spoke about. Very fast, iconic memory when you just see something but you're not thinking about it. Working memory is stuff you can rehearse, but without rehearsal it decays after about 30, 40 seconds. You can only hold a limited number in there. Long-term memory is not stuff that you're thinking about. It's stuff that you have stored permanently with a very large capacity. So that's what's uh, shown here. So anytime you experience anything, it's there for a short duration, sort of the, the, the time span of your conscious experience of it, that's iconic memory. If you start thinking about that and holding it in memory, even after it's gone, that act of thinking about it is working memory, but you can't do that for too many things. And then everything else that's really long-term memory that you have to retrieve stuff out of for it to become conscious is long-term memory. Okay, so I already mentioned working memory has a span of, has a capacity around seven items. Here's an example of iconic memory. It probably won't work because I don't have this set up for the timing to be right. But George Sperling did an experiment that illustrates um, the distinction between iconic and working memory. So the experiment is this. You would, you would look at a screen, and they would flash up this. And then they would say, report back to me all the numbers. And typically, people aren't very good at that. Uh, they can only do, say, three, four numbers, a small number of numbers. They make a lot of errors when, you, when they're asked that question. But you can do exactly the same experiment. So again, you flash it up. But right after flashing, after the stimulus is off the screen, at the offset of the stimulus, you cue people to think about a particular row. So it looks like this now. You have those come up, and then you would see, with better timing than I've done here, something like this. If you do that, people are able to report that particular row very well, even though the cue for what to pay attention to is only after the offset of the visual stimulus. So that shows you that even after the stimulus is gone from, from, from the screen, there is still some short duration trace 
that presumably has to do with latencies in the retina, latencies in responses of neurons in visual cortex. There's still something there that the brain can use in terms of a visual representation, even though there's no stimulus on the screen. That's iconic memory. So this example shows you how if you give a particular cue, somebody can use that ephemeral sort of one to two second trace of sensory memory and iconic memory to transfer it to working memory. Here's a more entertaining example. So this is from a Japanese researcher who works with chimpanzees. And these chimpanzees are trained, have been trained uh, to push uh, on the touch screen here these numbers in ascending numerical order. Okay. I guess depending on your priors here, this could be impressive or not. Um, and anyway, each time they go down, you get a little raisin or something, which is the only reason that they're doing this. But so they can do these numbers, they can recognize, after a lot of training, they can recognize what these numbers are and push them in ascending order. Okay, that doesn't have anything to do with memory. The experiment that he did was to now show that these chimpanzees have a remarkable, or seem to have a remarkable iconic visual memory by masking the numbers right after they, they're up. So now the experiment is this one, which is very hard. So it's the same task, except as soon as the numbers come up, they're masked. But the idea is that the chimpanzee can retain where they are. So they, it's chimpanzees doing this correctly in all these trials, presumably because the chimpanzee has a very uh, uh, much better iconic memory than you or I do. And this is actually this is the uh, reference to the paper down here. This is one of the um, sort of main psychological theories that people have about the types of memory between animals like chimps and us. That in our case. Our iconic memory for specific instances is actually not that good. And what we tend to do is to try and abstract from that. Whereas chimps pay attention to all of the details and encode that rather than abstracting uh, from that. But so this, but the point is, this just gives you a hands-on feel for what the chimp was using here was iconic memory. Okay. There are many things that improve memory. Um, and psychologists have studied this in, in, in great detail. The more recent something is, the more easy it is to remember, it's not uh, too hard to figure out. Uh, if it's in working memory, that's certainly one case. Even in long-term memory, there tends to be a decay, active forgetting, interference with other memories. All of those processes are minimized if something is very recent. If you pay attention to it, this uh, 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 augments encoding and consolidation uh, of memories. Emotion has been studied a lot in relation to traumatic memories. Both of these mechanisms, attention and emotion, are probably similar. And people have looked at uh, the particular chemicals, like norepinephrine, that is released when you're emotionally aroused, that seem to modulate memory encoding. If you, in general, if you ask people to just tell you about autobiographical memories, they will, they will be able to remember emotional events in their lives much better than less emotional events in their lives. They're encoded much more strongly. They can, this can also go in the opposite direction if you have traumatic memories, in which case they can be repressed in some cases, etc. But so emotion is a big modulator uh, of, uh, of memories. Repetition is, of course, one. So what happens in repetition is that you keep holding something in working memory. Working memory decays after about 30 seconds if you don't rehearse something, but you can actively keep rehearsing a bunch of phone numbers uh, for as long as you like. And each time, you're th as long as you're thinking about it, it is gradually being offloaded and consolidated into long-term memory. So if you keep repeating it, you will give long-term memory a much better chance to consolidate that, um, that memory. And then it's elaborated. Distinctiveness of the memories is important. And as I mentioned, sleep um, is quite important. People have looked at this. It's been tricky to do these experiments. But there is uh, unambiguous evidence, but so far uh, surprisingly uh, narrow, specific evidence, that at least some forms of uh, memory in humans and in other animals, but in humans, depend on sleep and actually depend on particular stages of sleep, particular ratios of REM to non-REM sleep and so on. So sleep serves an important role in memory consolidation. It's the only factoid to know. Here's another factoid, just to mention this. Um, this is a study, there's several papers, here's just one from researchers at UC Irvine, Jim McGaugh and colleagues. And what this somewhat dry plot here shows is the ability of um, uh, a bunch of people that have sort of ex extremely good memory, which are the open bars, to remember uh, particular uh, dates. 
and these are various kinds of things like the day of the week. So you would say something like um, January 7th, 1963. And for one of these people, they could say, okay, that was a Tuesday, and I remember reading the newspaper, and this and this happened. It would be a verifiable event. And they could tell you lots about their autobiography and so on. By comparison, control subjects generally can't, especially if you verify them. So there are people like this that have been studied. If you're interested, you can look at this paper and others by the same group at UC Irvine. Uh, that seem to remember everything that happened on every day of their lives, basically. So there, that seems to be a genuine phenomenon. Uh, it doesn't have any good explanation at this point, and sadly, it doesn't seem to help the people either. So they're not exceptional people. They're often just normal people with normal jobs that happen to be able to remember everything. But it's a striking illustration of how little we know about memory and also about the apparently unbounded capacity of long-term memory. It really seems as though these people just can replay any date in their lives, which is a lot of information. Um, there, on the negative side, there are many things that compromise memory. You'll hear about <coughs> Alzheimer's disease in some of the later lectures. Normal aging compromises memory. In each of these cases, we know something about the particular brain systems that are involved, and then there are various other <coughs> diseases, encephalitis, alcoholism, and specific drugs uh, like Valium, which acts on GABA-A receptors, and other drugs that act on acetylcholine neurotransmission. So there's particular neurotransmitter systems, and there's diseases that give us insight into some of the brain mechanisms. So what are those? Well, there's a lot of different brain regions involved. The one we'll take a look at in just a minute, by far the one we know the most about for declarative memory, are structures in the medial temporal lobe. But then in addition to that, actually everything you've heard about, everything we've looked about so far in sensory systems does play a role in memory. Uh, so they all play a role, but the medial temporal lobe is most critical in binding all of these together. So there's a bunch of systems there in cortex that subserve declarative memory, and then that's modulated by all these other structures that have to do with uh, signal to noise in terms of how memories might interfere with one another, with strategies for how to retrieve memories when you think about them. So there's lots of sort of modulatory systems in these from these uh, structures that are shown at the bottom here that can um, interact with this medial temporal lobe memory system, which involves interactions between medial temporal lobe and the rest of cortex that's responsible for declarative memory. So what do we know about that? Well, this, the main knowledge started with uh, one patient uh, called H.M., who um, had epilepsy, and for his, and his epilepsy originated in this region of the medial temporal lobe, including the hippocampus. Uh, so neurosurgeons came in, and they removed bilaterally on both sides of the brain the hippocampal formation and surrounding cortex, basically the medial temporal lobe, in this patient H.M. After the surgery, so actually let me take a look here. It's a little hard to see, but... Uh, here is the hippocampus that's been lesioned. Actually, this is pretty clear here. Here in this scan, these regions up here, these white ones here, and these T2-weighted scans of an MRI image show the regions in this patient's HM's brain that were lesioned. So there was a fair amount known about roughly the region that was lesioned. There's a lot more known since he passed away and people uh, sectioned his brain down at UCSD. There's actually a video you can watch of, of this brain being sliced in this block here. So people did post-mortem histology, and they know exactly now which parts of his, uh, his brain were lesioned. So he had damage to the hippocampus uh, and some other parts of the medial temporal lobe that resulted in a very specific impairment that you need to know. So here is where the surgery took place. That's the time of lesion to the medial temporal lobe. So very old memories from his childhood, he can remember. So that's there. He, that's stored, and he seems to be able to recollect that. As you get closer and closer to the time of his lesion, he remembers less and less. So the name for this is, this is a graded retrograde amnesia. So it's an amnesia, so it's impairment in declarative memory. Retrograde means it's for memory prior to some manipulation, this lesion, and it's graded. So what this shows you is that the medial temporal lobe, the hippocampus, is important for consolidating information from the past. So this is stuff that happened in the past, 
and then you lesion the hippocampus and it produces the amnesia. So this means that the hippocampus must still be important even after something happened for helping to consolidate it, but that role becomes less and less important the more remote the memory is. So if it's just one minute before the lesion and you do the lesion, then you wouldn't remember anything. If it's like an hour, the role of the hippocampus would be less critical, etc. So there's a time-dependent role for the hippocampus in consolidation, which should make intuitive sense to you. The more you consolidate it, the more stabilized the memory be becomes, and the memories themselves then become independent of the hippocampus as such. Going forward, it's as you would expect. So going forward, nothing can be consolidated because the hippocampus is critical for that initial consolidation, for transferring information from working memory representations into long-term memory. So there's a complete anterograde amnesia. So he can't learn anything new, and he remembers things from the past differentially well, such that the closer they get to the lesion, they, the worse his memory uh, is. That's shown here. It's maybe a bit hard to see, but so here's just a one original old experiment. If you show him pictures of famous faces, actors, politicians, etc. And here's a comparison control subject in invisible yellow at the top. Here's HN. So his lesion was in here. And you can see that if you go remotely in the 1940s, he remembers all those people. He can recognize the faces. As you get closer to the time of lesion, there's this graded retrograde amnesia. And anything forward, any new faces, he hasn't consolidated at all, and he can't recognize them. Any questions about that syndrome that's produced by lesions of the hippocampus? A graded retrograde amnesia together with a complete anterograde amnesia. What is spared is everything that's non-declarative. So this is one of the key pieces of evidence that shows the distinction between those two big form, psycholo initially psychologically defined forms of memory. So he can learn, he can learn non-declarative memories just fine. There's no anterograde amnesia for non-declarative memories. So, for instance, if you ask him to learn something he's never done, to do, uh, it's a little hard to see here, mirror tracing. He can learn to write his name or draw things while watching what he draws in a mirror. Okay, so normally if you do this, you go the wrong way. It's pretty hard. If you keep practicing, you get quite good at this. And he, he gets quite good. So his, that's what's plotted down here. And he uh, retains that knowledge. Same thing for any other kind of motor memory. Uh, same thing for Pavlovian fear conditioning. Uh, all these different memories that are non-declarative seem to be both learned and retained normally. There's no amnesia, either retrograde or anterograde. So this seems to show that the hippocampus plays a selective role in the encoding or the, uh, co the co initial consolidation of declarative memories. Any questions about that part? So let's take a look at this picture of the brain that we had before and see where this fits in the overall scheme of things. You've seen this a bunch of times now. So you would see something, and this is, as you, as you can see, not HM's brain or a human brain, but a monkey brain, on which they've schematized this. But if you see something, there would be visual representations down here in temporal cortex. And then you would act on those in this particular example here. The monkey would push a button, depending on what it sees, uh, depending on frontal lobe mechanisms. In between here is this is the medial temporal lobe, and this, so there's a whole uh, hierarchy of cortices and then the hippocampus that uh, serves this memory function for binding together these representations. It's a bit overwhelming here, but it's illustrated here. This is actually from a person who used to be here at Caltech, David Van Essen, together with uh, Dan Fellerman. You've seen this before. So here are your visual processing streams that start in the retina, the parvo and the magno, visual processing streams. It is all the different visual areas. You remember we saw a picture of all the different colors of uh, visual cortex that serve different functions. These lines denote connections between all these regions that people have figured out. And sort of at the apex of this hierarchy is ER, which stands for interrhinal cortex, and the hippocampus, HC, up here. So all of this information, not just from vision, but you could draw analogous diagrams for auditory system, somatosensory system, these all funnel into uh, cortex in the medial temporal lobe that then can serve to bind together and to consolidate representations uh, for those. And you find analogous systems that people have studied in primates, in rats, um, across species.
um, and I can see I need to accelerate a bit here to finish this off. You will hear uh, more on Monday about the molecular mechanisms on this of, of, for this. But so just to schematize it again, you have these association cortices. So these are higher order representations of what you've just experienced out there in the world. Neurons firing in these regions once you've seen something would uh, be an imp would implement iconic memory. And if you think about it and rehearse it in working memory, then some of this would be linked to uh, phonological loop or visuospatial scratch pad mechanisms that depend on the frontal lobe. But this information, these representations of what you experience, feed into these cortices here in the medial temporal lobe and eventually into the hippocampus. And then there are mechanisms in the hippocampus that are sh shown in this blown up version here that are quite well understood at the cellular level that stabilize those uh, uh, associations between all of these different patterns so that you can bind together a memory and reconstitute it and replay it when you recollect it. And as I mentioned, those consist of different mechanisms. There's, there's some mechanisms that are relatively short term. And again, this does, is not the same short term sense psychologically, but short term in terms of the, uh, the neurobiology which means that there are changes in receptors, phosphorylation of receptors, efficiency of synaptic transmission that is independent of gene transcription. And then there are long-term mechanisms that depend on transcription factors, on new proteins being made, and on longer-term changes happening, like insertion of receptors and actual ultrastructural changes, like making new synapses. Uh, I think this is pretty much the same thing here. And finally, one thing worth pointing out is that, as you heard in the development lecture, in addition to all of these changes, there are, in fact, new neurons that are born in your hippocampus. And those also play some role in memory. That's not very well defined, but it, uh, it's clear that they do play a role. So you have multiple mechanisms in this brain region, some having to do just with plasticity at a synapse in terms of just potentiating synaptic transmission some longer term in terms of actual changes in uh, gene transcription, ultrastructural changes, and indeed birth of new neurons that all uh, contribute to the memory function of the hippocampus. Mo uh, most of what we know about the detailed mechanisms uh, in the hippocampus come not from people but from animals. And so one big question is how would you test this? So everything I've talked to you about so far all depends on sort of conscious recollection, language, how would you test declarative memory? How would you test hippocampal dependent memory in animals? What do you find if you lesion the hippocampus in animals? Well, they, it's not that they can't tell you about facts anymore because they couldn't tell you about facts in the first place. What they can't do is something that's similar. They also don't seem to be able to bind together information that is stored uh, in this hippocampal dependent way. And the way that people have studied that, okay, I'll just go straight to this here, is in the so-called Morris water maze. So, if you take a hapless rat here, the task that its brain has to perform is to bind together information about the spatial location of some object. So if you have it zoom around, it can swim around in this milky bath. There's a submerged platform here it would like to go to, but it doesn't know where it is. So we put the rat in, it zooms around, it really hates swimming around, eventually it finds the platform. You do that a whole bunch of times, and eventually, after many trials, it makes a beeline to the platform. It has learned the spatial location of the platform. How has it learned that? It can't see the platform. It's underwater. The only way, under the milk, the only way it can learn where the platform is, is by integrating spatial information of a bunch of things on the walls, etc., with its own body location to figure out where this is spatially located. So this is the one test that people have developed in animals and one that um, seems to many people to be the most analogous, at least in rodents, here to this kind of declarative memory, which is spatial memory. Like declarative memory, we have to bind together information from many different sensory representations into a memory, when something happened, where it happened, what was there. Same thing here. The animal has to bind together information about many different spatial cues and its own body location to figure out where something is located uh, in space. If you manipulate this experimentally, so this would be sort of much more precise versions of what happened to HM in, in, in the human case uh, in a mouse. So you take a mouse and you put it in this uh, Morris water maze and you can find that normally, that's shown up here, the mouse will go over to the quadrant where the platform is and it has learned this. 
if you, do, if you lesion the hippocampus, it will not do that, and it will zoom around like this. If you do something more precise than that, if you inject drugs into the hippocampus that interfere with the molecular mechanisms for memory in the hippocampus, that prevent mechanisms like long-term potentiation, block certain recept glutamate receptors like the NMDA receptor, you find the same kind of thing. So there are good uh, correlations, certainly, uh, through experimental manipulation between manipulating the particular molecular mechanisms in the hippocampus, finding changes in the physiological signatures of memory, long-term potentiation, and finding changes in uh, be the behavior of the, of the animal. So you might think these are still, these are quite different, that, you know, in the human case, declarative memory depends on generating information about facts and so forth. In the animal, you're looking at, uh, at spatial memory. Um, and in the animal, you can't, do the, you can't do what you can do in humans. You can't ask it about facts. But you can certainly test spatial memory in humans, and people have done that. Uh, they've done this in a number of different ways. Maybe one of the more entertaining and one of the initial studies done in England was to look at London taxi drivers. Uh, so it turns out, not all of you may know this, that if you want to become a taxi driver in London, you have to take this test called the knowledge. You can look this up on Wikipedia. That's supposed to be the hardest test in the world. In fact, there's lots of websites that will sell you all these CDs and special things on how to become a London, how to train for becoming a London taxi driver. It, it's, a, it's sort of extreme training in spatial memory. So for those of you that have visited London, you know the sort of Byzantine arrangement of all the different streets and alleys and so forth. And you have to have a spatial map of that. You have to know where things are located in order to be able to quickly uh, reenact all that spatial layout that you've learned about so that you can very flexibly say, if I'm at point A, what's the shortest route to get to point B? So this also illustrates another key aspect of declarative and uh, of declarative memory, both verbally and spatially, in that it's very flexible. So you can use it for many different kinds of things. So if you want to get around in a city like London, you have to train a lot and you have to bind these things together. People have done uh, functional imaging studies in humans. The details of these may not be too compelling for you. There are more modern ones now. But they have looked at this region of the brain, the hippocampus, in people, in London cab drivers, and they find that there are indeed both functional and, what's shown in this uh, slide here, structural changes in the hippocampus. And moreover, those correlate with how long you've been a taxi driver. So you find that there are changes in the hippocampus that correlate with time spent taxi, be, being a taxi driver. Uh, and people have done similar studies in animals. So there seems to be quite a strong, again, correlation between the hippocampus and spatial memory as there was uh, between the hippocampus and um, and uh, verbal declarative memory. Okay, so that's one main uh, summary from this, that if you ask people what's declarative memory, and you just say, well, it's your memory for facts and events, well, memory for facts and events is how you test it in humans, but you can't test it that way in animals. The idea is that it's a flexible relational form of memory that binds different sensory representations together because of this hierarchical scheme that I sketched for you in the hippocampus. And so you could think of this as sort of the, the point where these pathways that we heard about in vision, the what and the where processing pathway that went into the parietal and temporal lobes, where these come together. So you have some item that you're processing. There's uh, uh, something about where it's located, spatial location here that's processed, that funnels uh, into the hippocampus, and there's separate uh, information about what it is. And this is a little abstract here, but these terms here and these different colors stand for particular regions of the medial temporal lobe that get this information. So you have these big streams that we had in the visual. This is just in the case of vision. Something analogous uh, is there for other sensory systems, but you have this big ventral stream here in the temporal lobe for object identification, this more dorsal stream for where things are located in space, and these both funnel down into this region and are bound together uh, by the hippocampus. Uh, last thing just to mention, um, in terms of comparative studies, so rodents, monkeys, humans have been studied a lot, but it turns out that birds actually have phenomenal, um, what looks like actually episodic 
memories as well. And people have studied this in corvids, which are birds like crows and jays. And uh, scrub jays, for instance, uh, will store food and have um, uh, something that really looks like episodic memory. So they're able to remember where they, you can watch this if you just go to the foothills here and you watch a, watch a scrub jay. What they will take is you know, acorns or any other kind of food that you give them, and they will cache these. They make caches for the winter. So they hide them under pine needles and stuff, and they make many caches all over the place, lots and lots of caches. So they have to remember where those are spatially. There's lots of them. Then they have to remember what they cache, and it turns out they can remember what they cache and when they cached it. So if you give them perishable food, and they cache it, they will remember that, and they will go to that cache to retrieve the food that is the most perishable before they go to the other caches to cache other foods. So they have to remember where they put it, what it is, and when they put it there, and then they, you can use that flexibly. So for instance, they, they also pay attention to other birds to make sure they don't pilfer the caches that they're watching them put, put the food in. So anyway, it, it seems like episodic memory probably evolved independently uh, several times in order for animals to be able to come up with a very flexible way of making use of information, like we said at the very beginning of the course of the class, making use of multiple sources of information from the past in order to most flexibly guide your behavior into the future. So that's the function of declarative memory. And we'll stop there and you'll hear about non-declarative memory next Wednesday. Um, I have time for a coffee. Sounds good. Sounds good.